Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Hello and welcome. This is the MIT Faculty Forum Online Alumni Edition. I'm Wade Rausch. I'm Outreach Officer for the Program in Science, Technology, and Society at MIT, and I'm a fellow MIT alum and I'll be the moderator of our panel today. So we're gonna be talking today about advances in nanotechnology and the whole point of this faculty forum online um, alumni edition is that it's your chance to interact with our guests. So after I introduce um, our speakers and they get to talk about themselves a little bit, we'll be taking questions from you. And to submit a question, all you need to do is fill in the form uh, below the screen. There's a Google form, and that will uh, will send the question directly to my screen, and I'll get to as many of your questions as possible um, later on in the broadcast. You can also tweet about the, the forum using the hashtag uh, MIT alum. So if you haven't been on the MIT campus lately, uh, you may have missed the enormous construction project that's underway uh, just behind the Great Dome. It's the new Building 12, also known as MIT.nano, and it's scheduled to open in 2018. MIT.nano will provide 200,000 square feet of classrooms and teaching laboratories and clean rooms and maker spaces and all sorts of other great stuff. And it'll more than double the capacity um, around MIT for fabrication and imaging and other capabilities. It'll also be a hub of activity for research across many fields from manufacturing and prototyping to chemical and biological engineering to communications and healthcare. So today we're speaking with three former MIT postdocs who, if they'd been here, might have benefited from such a facility. And um, they're, they're now doing research using nanotechnology in various fields at their university and are going to tell us a little bit about some of that today and we'll have a discussion. So joining us uh, first are uh, Ehud Gazit, a professor of life sciences at Tel Aviv University. Uh, and Ehud is a, a former postdoc in uh, Bob Sauer's lab in the Department of Biology. Then we're going to hear from um, Sam Tofik, who is Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he's a former postdoc in the mechanosynthesis group led by Professor John Hart in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT and the Lab for Manufacturing and Productivity. And finally, we have joining us um, Catherine Whitehead, who is Assistant Professor of Chemical Engineering and also has an appointment in Biomedical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, Catherine is um, literally uh, a little mobile today in that uh, she had a fire alarm in her building uh, about five minutes before we were about to start this broadcast. So she's joining us from her roving laptop um, and we're gonna let her go third just to make sure she has time to find a quiet place from which to do the broadcast. So um, Ehud, I'm gonna start with you actually and ask you to speak a little bit about what you're working on, uh, your current research there at Tel Aviv and, um, and fill us in about um, what you've done at, at MIT and how that's led into your work now. Okay. Thank you very much, Wade. So our work is really in the field of what I would describe bio-nanotechnology uh, and also bio-inspired nanotechnology. So our approach in the last 15 years already, uh, since I left MIT in 2000, was try to understand and define the minimal recognition module within the biological world that can allow the formation of well-ordered structures at the nanoscale. So we started with uh, the, uh, building blocks as long as five amino acids, pentapeptides, to four amino acids, to two amino acids. Our uh, paper in Science was the first demonstration that the dipeptide, and, uh, a fragment of a protein that is composed of only two amino acids in form ordered structures at the nanoscale, nanotubes. Uh, later on, we were able to make nano, uh, nanospheres, nanoplates, all kinds of objects that you are familiar with uh, in the macroscopic world, we can make in the nano world. Uh, this sounds abstract, but it, we, we uh, realize that we can get also new chemistry and physics with all these structures. So by having minimal building blocks to form these structures, we get all kinds of unique physical properties, like very strong mechanical rigidity. 
uh, we get uh, effects like uh, luminescence at the, at the visible uh, range of the electric, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. We get piezoelectric properties. We get semiconductivity. And this is one of the things about nano. When you go to the nanoscale, you get all kinds of new properties. And actually, this now the building blocks that we developed are being used by hundreds of groups uh, around the world, which led us to new activities. One that got quite a lot of uh, attention in the media was our divergence from natural building blocks to some kind of a synthetic one known as peptide nucleic acid, PNA. It's a combination of peptide building blocks together with DNA side chains. Uh, published a few months ago in Nature Nanotechnology, where we demonstrated the ability to converge the two fields of peptide nanotechnology, in which we were very active for, for many years, uh, together with the field of DNA nanotechnology, which is uh, the, has its own, uh, its own uh, advantages by the specific recognition between uh, uh, DNA bases to form structures that, uh, 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 that uh, can utilize the, the both words. They have interaction, stacking interaction, like you see in proteins. They have DNA uh, base pairing, like you see in, uh, in DNA, which got us to very dense structures. And then, again, we see new physics. We see uh, luminescence, uh, which is red edge shift. It means that the uh, we get colored structure, but change the structure according to wavelength in which they are excited. So it could be red, green, orange, blue, depending on the on the on, on the light in which we. So it's a, a multicolor light emitting devices. Finally, our uh, another direction that is related again more to biology. We thought well. Does uh, dipeptide represent uh, the smallest structural unit that can form structures? And then we realize that also smaller uh, building blocks like metabolites, uh, uh, amino acids, and uh, and others can form other structures. It gave us new paradigm to inborn error of metabolism. So, so it's really a lot of work to describe in five minutes, but. Uh, if I could summarize it, is we, we uh, realize that very simple building blocks can form ordered structures. Uh, you can use biology to get uh, all kinds of architecture. You get new physics when you get to, uh, 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 to such small scales. And you can go back to biology, understand new disease, develop another things that I did, didn't go into in details. We are developing ways to manipulate uh, the, the formation of the structure and then develop uh, new drug entities. The most advanced one that we have is currently in a phase one clinical trials. So there's a lot in the nano in the nano field, and I'm very happy for uh, MIT that uh, you get the new nano center, uh, well deserved, and uh, I'm sure that uh, I will be very happy to visit her. Yeah, so we'll this is really in a nutshell. Well, let me ask a quick question. Do you? I'm sorry, there's a big echo, so I'm going to have to ignore that. The um, you talked about tuning um, protein or peptide-based nanoparticles to emit different colors of light, and that sort of leads directly to the idea of uh, having perhaps uh, sort of biologically based displays. And I just wanted to ask quickly: um, Are those kinds of materials? Um, are they? Do they have a quick enough response time? Are they stable enough? Is there an obvious path to be able to incorporate those kinds of materials into a, um, a piece of hardware? Yes. So actually, it's an excellent question, and, and the, the media got the attention of our publication because of uh, the, the prospects uh, for this application. And we already, being really a global village, we now have investment from the Tata Group in India in this technology to, uh, to make it into reality. Actually, it has many advantages as compared to the conventional inorganic-based uh, uh, technologies. We are not uh, uh, sensitive to oxidation, as you may know in many of the uh, quantum or inorganic quantum dot-based devices. You need 
to uh, uh, to avoid the contact with uh, uh, with oxygen by by very uh, uh, good sealing, which is uh, uh, much better. We have good response time. We're still struggling with uh, quantum wheel, but we are learning all the tricks. I, I feel you asked in the beginning how I uh, related to to my time at MIT at the end of the 90s when I was a postdoc was just the beginning of the study of uh, inorganic quantum dots by several groups at, at MIT and I feel that you know 15 17 years later we are now discovering the the work on uh, on biological and generally in, with uh, uh, organic quantum dots uh, which is this uh, so there's a, there's a lot of prospect. There are many advantages as compared to inorganic structures. There are still challenges, but this is the excitement about science, as we all know. Absolutely. Thanks, Ehud. All right, I'm going to move over now to, to Sam Taufik um, and ask Sam to talk a little bit about uh, his work. He's building um, microstructures with carbon nanotubes, which carbon nanotubes have been around for, well, a long time now. I mean, they were the talk uh, when I was in grad school, and that was 25 years ago. So but where are we getting now with what we can build with carbon nanotubes, Sam? So uh, thanks for the introduction, and I think uh, this is like a perfect uh, point at which to start, and I will start from what uh, Ehud uh, uh, explained earlier. So carbon nanotubes have already demonstrated great properties on the small scale. So for example, if you take an individual nanotube and measure, you'll find those outstanding combination of properties, and this is what makes them special. And this has been known for some time now. I think what's uh, becoming really uh, exciting about this field is uh, can we scale up the properties of carbon nanotubes to um, applications that require many, many of them and that can span several meters and maybe hundreds of meters large scales and combining their multifunctionality, not just, for example, their mechanical properties. So I'm in the mechanical engineering department, but right now, you know, you can't uh, propose any stru new structural material that's only good to carry load. What you want to do is have a, a structural material that can do many things, carry load, sense its own mechanical property, sense its own uh, degradation, uh, maybe have uh, electrostatic discharge cap capability, uh, good thermal properties, and so on and so forth. And maybe I will try to share uh, my screen. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Um, Uh, and show you this plot. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. So this plot is uh, the answer to your question. So on the on the x-axis, you show the scale of the application. So nano are uh, usually uh, small scale applications like a transistor uh, or a small device or a sensor or an LED. Macro is larger scale applications like an airplane or a ship. And on the y-axis, you see the order. So the order is extremely important. Everyone is talking about it because when you start building from the bottom up, building blocks, then it becomes extremely important um, to have a good hierarchical order uh, uh, in the way uh, you design it as the material designer. Uh, to achieve specific properties. And my research and the research of uh, the mechanosynthesis group and my current research group plays on the top right corner uh, of uh, this plot. So we try to not only get uh, large quantities of carbon nanotubes and uh, disperse them, but we try to think about uh, what kind of, uh, you know, ordered materials we can build out of carbon nanotubes and structure them in three-dimensional uh, uh, come up with new processes to scale up their properties. So this uh, belongs to um, a field uh, defined by the Government uh, Accountability Office as uh, nano manufacturing, uh, and that field um, is concerned on basically what they call the valley of death. You know, you have uh, great properties of nanomaterials on the small scale. Uh, but what is their economical impact? So that itself is now shaping itself as a field of research and not just uh, something that can only be carried out, let's say, using uh, startup companies. I think uh, the challenges are fun fundamental, although they are challenges in scaling up, uh, but the ch many of the challenges are fu fundamental and need, uh, need um, 
uh, need to be addressed, uh, I think, uh, in academia. So my current projects, for example, are uh, some of what I mentioned earlier. So uh, making uh, carbon nanotube composites that can uh, that can be uh, made in three-dimensional forms, uh, making uh, parts made almost entirely out of carbon nanotubes. So 60 and 70 percent uh, loaded carbon nanotubes, making surfaces, three-dimensional surfaces from carbon nanotubes with specific geometry for applications uh, uh, like non-wetting surfaces and so on that can have also very good mechanical properties, good durability, good reliability. And this was uh, also featured on the MIT website uh, last year. Um, um, I have uh, other uh, things I'm working on um, with carbon nanotubes like shock absorption as well as electrical conductivity. And these are all uh, combination of properties um, that are uh, required by our uh, sponsors, for example. Great. So what would you say would be some of the first um, products to actually make it to the consumer market or the industrial market? Are, do you have things already on the market, or what would be the from first From my thing? research or yeah. uh, in from carbon nanotubes in general? From your research. From uh, Okay. From my research, I think uh, one of the first things that I'm expecting to see on the market, it's, it's, uh, it's still not there, is um, what we call 3D microstructures, uh, which uh, the, the ones that were featured on the MIT website, I did that uh, when I was a postdoc at MIT, and I'm still working on it with uh, many other collaborators, uh, which is uh, microstructures, uh, but they, they don't need to be done in uh, uh, using microfabrication techniques or in the clean room and they are made out of CNTs uh, and, uh, for example, they can be uh, super hydrophobic. And uh, we are currently still, uh, we haven't uh, pursued any, um, you know, starting uh, a company, but we are currently in the process of uh, discussing. Would a hydrophobic material be something you would use on the outside of a watercraft or would it be for a package or a ketchup no, bottle? I mean, what, we, what are we talking about? Yeah, so uh, that that is still not clear. clear. I think we're not there yet. Uh, because we uh, we didn't reach the point where we say you know where are they going to be commercially useful? Uh, we we know they have good properties. We know it's a very scalable. Uh, we have a very scalable way of manufacturing them, uh, but we still didn't get there to see what is. There are many potential markets, but I can't say for sure which one is going to be the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks so much, Sam. So, so many potential markets, and it's hard to say which the first will be. I, I think that's probably the case in medicine and um, and biology as well. So, I'm going to actually um, throw things now over to Katie. So, Katie, I think you're um, you're muted at the moment, but yeah, okay, great. Can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your research and uh, uh, what you've been up to since you left MIT? Sure. So uh, my work in nanotechnology focuses on the use of lipid nanoparticles for applications in a number of different types of gene therapy. So you probably hear about the DNA delivery, RNA delivery uh, that's capable or that we're capable of doing today. Um, and so as the biologists have kind of revolutionized the field, the engineers have needed to come in and come up with delivery solutions to try to get some of these genetic medicines into the right cells and the right targets inside of the body. So uh, most of my work is focused on the development of what we call lipidoid nanoparticles. And a lipidoid is a lipid-like material. And so it, it has a polar kind of head group, if you want to call it that. And then it can have anywhere from two to, say, eight different fatty tails, whereas a traditional lipid would only have two. Uh, but good ones can self-assemble into these nice liposomal structures that will hold on to different types of drug cargo. And so most of the work that I've done has centered on using these materials for siRNA delivery, which is short interfering RNA. Um, but you can also use them to deliver different types of drugs, uh, relatively small proteins, things under about 20 to uh, 30 kilodaltons or so. You can use them to deliver chemotherapeutics and some other small molecules depending on the properties of those molecules. Um, so when I, when I first was working with these materials, it's interesting when you think about delivering materials to different parts of the body, if you were to imagine, okay, we're going to make a nanoparticle and we're going to inject it into the bloodstream. As an engineer, we need to design a material that can do many, many different things. 
It needs to be able to go through the bloodstream where there are a lot of immune cells looking to uh, basically phagocytose or take in all these materials, clear them from the bloodstream. Okay, so we need to avoid that. And then our particle is going to need to be able to exit the bloodstream. Perhaps we're interested in, in delivering things to the liver. Okay, so exit the bloodstream, somehow get to the vicinity of the liver, and then when it's there, to get to the right liver cells, and then when it's outside of the liver cell, to say, well, how am I going to get it inside the liver cell? That doesn't just happen. So there's something about our delivery material, our nanoparticle, that needs to promote that process. And then even once that happens, the cell kind of will bring in the particle, but it has it in this walled-off container called an endosome. Okay, and because the cell's a little cautious, it's just brought something in from outside and it's like, I don't know if I want this. So, you know, even then our particle is probably not going to get released inside of the cell. So we're asking a delivery vehicle, we're asking these lipid nanoparticles to do a lot of different things. And so how does one go about rationally designing chemistry that will be able to avoid immune clearance and cross, um, you know, the blood vessel and get into the cell and get out of the endosome? I have no idea. I'm not sure if anybody really knows. And so what we did was was we made 5,000 chemicals. Um, so I made 5,000 different lipidoids um, during my previous work and we just, we said, we kind of acknowledged, I wanted to acknowledge that we didn't understand the biology that was happening and so we wanted to better understand what chemical structures we could put into our nanoparticles that would be able to achieve all of these different functions. So we learned some very interesting things at the end of the day. We developed materials that are extremely potent at delivering these siRNA type drugs. Um, and I should probably mention what they're good for for those who aren't aware. siRNA drugs can essentially turn off the production of any protein in the body. As long as you can get the drug to the right kind of cell, um, you know, we can have, we can have, um, the silencing of a particular protein. So for example, in cancer, we can reduce the expression of oncoproteins or oncogenes, as you may have heard of, uh, when it comes to even something as simple as high cholesterol. You know, there's a protein associated with that. We can go into the liver and try to reduce the expression um, of that particular protein. Um, so there's tremendous uh, therapeutic potential with these particular types of drugs. But again, we need these delivery vehicles. So a lot of our work has focused on coming up with the chemistry that's going to be able to do that. And we've learned a lot about what sorts of chemistries are feasible uh, to the point that we can predict what's going to work in an animal. So we could just draw on the whiteboard if we wanted to a number of different structures. And if we're able to make them, and I'm not an organic chemist, so that's not my strength, but if we can make them, um, I bet you they're going to work when we put them in an animal. Uh, so now uh, different members of my lab, uh, those of those of them who work with these lipid nanoparticles, we are using them to treat a variety of different types of disease. Uh, because in theory, you can apply this type of technology to any disease that is associated with an overexpression of a protein. So I have one student who's using our particles to treat a very uh, deadly type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It's called mantle cell lymphoma. And so in this case, we want our nanoparticles to target those cancer cells specifically and knock down um, some proteins within them that cause them to undergo apoptosis, which is a type of essentially cell suicide or programmed cell death. Um, and then I have another student, we're working on the oral delivery of these particles for treatment of things like inflammatory bowel disease. And in that case, your nanoparticle is being put in a completely different environment, the GI tract. So that's pretty interesting to try to circumvent a lot of the protection that your GI tract has in place. We have all these enzymes in there um, that are going to try to essentially digest the nanoparticle. So how can we overcome those challenges? Um, and then finally, I have a student right now working on treating chronic wounds and particularly diabetic foot ulcers with these sorts of particles. Um, but really, the sky is the limit as far as applications are concerned. So Katie, it sounds like you're, you're moving beyond the sort of uh, combinatorial approach toward a more rational approach to designing these lipid nanoparticles. I mean, do you feel like you're getting more rational about it? I mean, I've, I, I would say that I personally have become more rational, um, and that's partially a function of in my own lab. Uh, you know, first of all, 
we spent a lot of time and effort and money coming up with the with the previous materials and we have some that are working well so my main focus is trying to now use them because really what I want to do is to be able to help people and help patients um, with with what we're, we've developed here um, but is this are these the only types of materials that can do this I really doubt it if I had infinite resources I would start with a completely different type of material maybe some ones that we think would have the right kind of properties but you know, ones that I couldn't necessarily predict what they would do. Um, you know, and I, I, I get really excited about large libraries of material, so I'm not going to say I'll never do that again. Um, but for now, we're okay being rational. Terrific. Okay, well, thank you, all three of you, for those fantastic introductions. We're getting some great questions coming in from the audience, and I will encourage everybody watching to use that Google form right below the screen to submit your own questions. But I'm going to relay now a question from one of our viewers. Um, Shuffley in the UK asks, um, how cheap will the materials that you work with get? Uh, is, it, is the cost for scaling up your research coming down? So, um, so Shefley's asking basically about the, the materials you're working in, with in your lab and whether it's getting cheaper to, to do the research you need to do using those materials. So anybody inspired to jump in on that? I think that uh, I, I will jump with, with, with my work. I, I, may, uh, 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 I may say something about the, the carbon structure that uh, Summer is working on. Uh, I think that what we see is uh, um, the fact that building blocks for forming uh, structures at the nanoscales are getting less and less expensive. I think that we are reaching uh, a situation in which nanomaterials, either inorganic nanomaterials, bio nanomaterials, organic nanomaterials, carbon based nanomaterials, will become a reality for consumer goods for a, a, all kinds of application, which seems to be too expensive. So I, I think that this is something that we see in, in many industries. The, the, the cost of material is getting lower and lower. And this is when we move from science, in the place that all of us are, into engineering and the manufacturing. And uh, I hope that we'll uh, reach this, uh, this day. And I think uh, what Samech said, uh, uh, a, a describe is getting towards this uh, these directions. I hope that we can do it also with uh, with the, the biological structures. Uh, we try to apply uh, methods, learning from the carbon uh, guys using uh, CVD and uh, chemical vapor deposition methods and other to make the structures. So this is this is this is the advancement now. Sam, what about your lab? Is it getting cheaper to make CNTs? So, uh, in our lab, uh, I, I, I don't think it's getting cheaper for our lab, uh, but CNTs in terms of uh, large-scale manufacturing are getting a lot cheaper. Let me uh, share also uh, my screen. And although this doesn't really show the price, but it shows the manufacturing. Can you see my screen? Yes. So if you look at this graph, look at the right axis, production capacity. Uh, so this is the, pro the estimated current CNT production capacity uh, in, uh, let's, say, let's say, around 5,000 tons per year. And it's clearly growing exponentially. Actually, just in 2014, this number was increased by another 10,000 tons per year. So that's about 15,000 uh, tons per year. And as a reference, if you look at the bottom left corner of the slide below the graph, the Kevlar annual production is 50,000 tons per year. So carbon nanotube production is approaching one third of Kevlar, and that in only a few years. Um, and, and this drives the cost down, of course. Uh, it depends on what kind of CNTs you're getting. Uh, the ones that are driving the cost down are the ones that are dispersed uh, randomly. Um, but what's important is they made an uh, economical impact. So mm -hmm. they had they had a real impact on the automotive industry, for example. They're used uh, in fuel lines. So if you own a Volkswagen or an Audi, uh, most probably, uh, other than the scandal, you have uh, carbon nanotubes in your fuel lines, which are um, helping uh, the plastics become safer. Katie, is there anything expensive about the materials that, that go into your lipid nanoparticle? 
uh, search? Uh, not compared to the cost of the drug. So okay. we worry about it a lot less. Okay. Um, I, I know that um, Ehud has a question for Sam. So Ehud, let me jump in and let you ask that question. That's true. One thing, a, a, a major hype in the field of carbon nanostructure was the combination of carbon structures together with organic and even biological one, which I feel that wasn't developed as we uh, expected. Uh, um, we see, and if, I, if I make the parallel comparison to the polymer field, the addition of new groups made us uh, uh, to, to get uh, into Teflon, nylon, Kevlar that you mentioned. When do you think that uh, we'll see more car modified carbon-based nanostructures? That's a very interesting question. So it's been uh, something, you know, uh, that many are <coughs> interested in uh, the functionalization of carbon nanotubes. I think it's all about rational design. Uh, uh, there are several demonstrations, but consistently there are trade-offs. I can't think of a single carbon nanotube functionalized without uh, a clear trade-off in another uh, property that's usually relevant as well. So for example, uh, let's think about the simplest, um, uh, the simplest uh, application, which is replacing carbon fibers uh, by adding carbon nanotubes, which are uh, supposed to be stronger. In fact, uh, only in 2015, I saw the first demonstration of a carbon nanotube polymer composite that is stronger than a carbon fiber composite. Uh, uh, so it took, let's say, and, and maybe the first paper on a, on a, on a reinforced uh, polymer uh, carbon nanotube composite was maybe in 1999 or 2000. So it's been, it, it has taken us 15 years to get to numbers, like real values that make sense. Uh, during the 15 years, we were just learning how to uh, make the CNTs uh, be functionalized such that they don't slip with respect to the polymer, but at the same time keep their strength. As simple as that. This took 15 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm very excited that, you know, at least, like, if this uh, uh, webinar was uh, a year ago, I wouldn't have mentioned that there currently exists a carbon nanotube polymer composite stronger than a carbon fiber composite. That's exciting stuff. So thanks, guys. I'm going to go back to the audience questions. Um, this is a question for, for Katie. Um, will cancer be cured more by biochemical means or biomechanical means? So I guess to rephrase the question, uh, what, what's the future role for, for engineered and, uh, materials in the delivery of uh, chemotherapy drugs? And how important will that get? I think it'll be increasingly important as we learn more about how nanomaterials interface with tumors and how we can use them to actively seek out tumors. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the questioner means by, by biomechanical means, um, but I definitely think, you know, cancer is going to be cured on a case-by-case -case basis, as um, the viewer is likely aware, every type of cancer is essentially completely different, a completely different beast of a disease, and so some of them are a lot more amenable to nanote nanotechnology-based therapies than others. Um, but I think it's a very challenging area, and I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to be interested to see what, nano, what nanotechnology can do in the years ahead, because I think so far it hasn't done as much as any of us would have liked to have seen um, in the nanospace. And, and just because you can make something small, we're finding it doesn't mean it's actually going to enter tumors. It doesn't make it any easier necessarily to seek out those tumors, I often like it, liken it to like, you know, okay, we're going to take a small molecule or a nanoparticle and we're going to set it loose in this room here, which maybe is the bloodstream, but my tumor's across the street somewhere. And so just because my particle is small doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be able to jump out the window and, and get to the right place. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that answers the, the viewer's question, but um, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, and I think nanotechnology will play a role. It's just unclear 
if it's going to be as hyped as kind of what it's been made out to be. Okay. Um, well, getting particles to the right place, that kind of gives me a segue to my next question, and it does relate to an audience question as well. It's really about um, dealing with the possible downsides of nanotechnology. And to, to, to the credit of, of science and scientists, I think this discussion has been going on for as long as nanotech has been a reality. There have been people worrying about um, gray goo and you know the spread of nanotech in the environment in unchecked ways and then I guess also uh, sort of the flip side of that or the the, the complement to that is figuring out what um, nanoparticles do in the body and what effect they might have on different organs so we have a, a, a Ivan from Los Angeles asking please address problems with carbon nanotubes in the environment a recent news release stated that we all have CNTs in our lungs. Um, I didn't see that release. But that would be uh, that would be remarkable. Um, but um, but obviously uh, there are there are folks out there hearing the news about advances in nanotech and worrying um, ab about the the future. I think Ehud. I think you said uh, at one time that nanotech will be to the 21st century what plastic was to the 20th century, and that's both wonderful and freaky and scary, right? Um, because uh, plastic is now in all sorts of places that we never meant it to be. Yeah, but I think that uh, it, it's parallel also in, in what we see with safety. Plastic and all kinds of uh, uh, organic polymer save the life of millions or maybe tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people in the, in, with medical devices. On the other end, in the environment, it could be a quite... Uh, uh, unsafe and uh, even dangerous to have some some residues in our environment. As any new technology, it should be studied carefully. Should take the advantage, the the, the, the wonderful advantage of nanotechnology. We should be very uh, candid and and open about the discussion about the the possible problems, uh, possible uh, uh, dangers. With uh, with nanotechnology, and uh, I think that uh, this is th this is the situation with any new technology. We have to be careful. We have to be open. We we have to uh, to see uh, things in, in in the in the right and clear way. But of course, there are dangers in nanotechnology. I cannot deny it. Well, Sam or Katie, maybe you could uh, talk about how, how these concerns work their way into your daily uh, lives in the laboratory um, or in, in your committee work or your, your writing. Do you, at what point do you stop and step back and say, okay, um, are we thinking carefully enough about the potential um, sort of unintended consequences of, uh, of uh, nanotechnology research? Sure. I, um, I think about the unintended effects a lot of times just within the body. I, I worry a little bit less about the environment because it's less acute. Not to say that I don't care about the environment, I do. Um, but when it comes to nanotechnology, we've been really gung-ho about using these for therapeutic applications. And at the end of the day, uh, our immune system is here for a reason, and our immune system has been designed to identify foreign substances, which are going to include therapeutics, um, you know, and their and their vehicles in the nanoparticle format. You know, so our, our immune system is going to be activated by these materials, maybe to a greater or a lesser degree, depending on the chemistry and the shape and so forth. Um, but a lot of materials that move into clinical trials, they they can fail because of unintended or and things that you couldn't predict ahead of time, toxicity or immunogenicity in a person. And so I would love for there to be a little bit more focus on understanding what it is about chemistry and structure of these nano, nanomaterials is interfacing with the immune system. Um, you know, people don't like to talk about it because they, you know, as, as with all of academia, we get attention when we make things that work. We don't we don't get as much attention when we say, you know what, there's a problem here and we would like to understand exactly what it is that's causing the problem. But, you know, that is what I want to do because I want to make materials that aren't going to provoke the immune system. And I think just the way we talk about structure-function relationships where the function is efficacy, we can also talk about these relationships when the function is um, an immune response. Right. 
Um, Sam, can you conf confirm or debunk this idea that we've already got um, carbon nanotubes yeah. sort of all around us? Yes. Uh, so I've seen this uh, news article, and you know it was also mentioned that uh, it's not uh, clear where these uh, came from, and it's, it's not clear if they have uh, any harm. However, uh, I agree that uh, it's extremely important, uh, of course, to keep an eye on uh, some of the possible environmental effects related to carbon nanotubes especially. So we did that uh, in my previous lab um, uh, when I was at Michigan and we actually invited uh, an environmental engineer who's uh, uh, now a, pro a professor at uh, Yale University, Desiree Plata, and she came and she did you know, several studies in our lab on carbon nanotubes and if they're airborne or not and uh, how do we make sure at least within our lab environment that uh, uh, it is safe to work uh, in the environment. And uh, we had very nice insights, um, for example, that the form and diameter of nanotubes make a big impact uh, on this. Uh, so not just uh, the, the diameter, not just single wall versus multi wall but she found out for, that, for example, the form of aligned CNTs that we work with in our lab uh, is less prone to uh, becoming airborne, and it's uh, it's mostly even when, like she, you know, she did uh, studies on that. There are papers on that, and it was featured on the Discovery Channel. So the details matter. It's very important to keep an eye, uh, but we can't really generalize. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to try and take one more question from the audience, and then we'll have to wrap up. And um, this relates to. Um, well, it relates back to the MIT.nano facility. So uh, Bruce in Portland, Maine asks, how precious is space like clean rooms and labs for these growing nanotech uh, research fields at your college or university? Um, and maybe I could expand on the question and say, what's, what's sort of the rate limiting thing um, that uh, if you had, um, if you could turn on the spigot, what would allow you to go twice as fast in your research right now? Um. May I, I may start and then and be quite uh, 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 quite fast on this. I, I think that uh, our main limitation in our case, because we are working on new building blocks, is the ability to synthesize and characterize uh, the different building blocks because we are building a library uh, of new structures, so it's a lot of chemical synthesis. Electron microscopy. Electron microscopy is the is the microscope. As for the biologists, were the microscope uh, in the previous century for us. It's the electron microscope, and we use it on on, on daily basis, of course. Um, and uh, and the facilities for growing. Uh, the, we, we usually don't use clean room, but rather vapor deposition and other methods. But uh, these are. If I would be brief, as we are about to, uh, to finish the, the, the seminar, this, for us it's the chemical synthesis, electron microscopy, and uh, the ways for deposition and growth the, the, of the structure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Katie, what about in your work? Unmute myself. Um, in my work, I mean, clean rooms and stuff like that are not used. Um, so that's not at all a limitation. Um, as far as other limitations, in my world, it's it's just a matter of uh, what what we can afford as far as uh, the drugs are concerned, because um, that really is what opens up the potential for a lot more testing. Um, so for me, the main the the main challenge is going to be funding, which I suppose in some way or another is everyone's challenge. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of resources to do monetary resources to do the work we do. I'm sorry, but by the drugs, do you mean that actually buying the short interfering RNA drugs to, to mm -hmm. deliver using your vehicles, that, that part is expensive? That part is expensive, and um, as we develop new types of drugs, so mRNA, messenger RNA, is another type of genetic medicine. It's becoming, um, you know, uh, increasingly prominent these days. Very expensive. And so siRNA has been around for a decade now, so the price has come down a little bit, but mRNA... There isn't a lot of competition yet um, for making these types of drugs, um, and it's a lot of work to be able to do it. These are all 5,000 uh, nucleotide materials, and so um, very expensive. Yep. Gotcha. Sam, what, what's keeping you from making progress faster? What, what's the rate-limiting step in your yeah. lab? 
So facilities are not the lead, uh, lead, uh, limiting steps definitely at the University of Illinois. I think if the new MIT facility is as good as the University of Illinois facility, it will help it uh, accelerate <laughs> research by a lot. Uh, so we have uh, uh, excellent facilities. Uh, but I think uh, what we can do in general in the field of nanotechnology to help everyone is find better ways to share knowledge uh, and to share protocols, to share ways of synthesizing materials, uh, to share steps and so on. So building a common knowledge base that's systematic and that can be shared and adopted by different research groups in a systematic way, I think we didn't get there yet uh, with uh, the, the, you know, the infinite number of variations that you can do, the differences between tools and the differences between materials and uh, sources where you get materials and so on. So I think uh, knowledge can be pushed a lot faster if there are more effective ways of building on each other's, um, you know, uh, knowledge and processes and so on. I think, in, in, yeah. Well, thank you. So Sam, thanks. I think with that we're going to have to uh, to wrap it up. So this has been really terrific and, and interesting and uh, and we, I know we've only scratched the surface, so to speak. So um, uh, it's tantalizing as well, and I wish we had more time. But I'd like to thank each of you today for joining us. Uh, we'd like to thank our, our former MIT postdocs now at Tel Aviv University, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and Carnegie Mellon University. On behalf of the MIT Alumni Association and the Program in Science, Technology, and Society at MIT, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to this Faculty Forum Online Alumni Edition. We did not get to all of the questions that you submitted. Uh, but we'll be certain to pass those questions on to our panelists uh, after this. And you can also tweet about this event using, uh, as I said, the hashtag MIT alum. And we'll be posting this later on YouTube so other folks can watch. And you can send uh, follow-up questions and feedback to the email address alumnilearn at mit.edu. That's one word, alumnilearn at mit.edu. Thanks for joining us today, and have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.